International News Now. All right, so last Thursday, President Trump fired his national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, and appointed his replacement, John Bolton. Recall that the national security advisor plays an extremely important role in the implementation of U.S. foreign policy. He or she coordinates among all the bureaucratic agencies in the executive branch that have some role in foreign policy. So what do these agencies include? They include the State Department, the Defense Department, all the intelligence agencies, the military, the Treasury, the Commerce Department, and U.S. Trade Representative. The national security advisor has daily contact with the president generally presenting something called the presidential daily brief outlining in the morning all the potential security threats that the U.S. faces in the short term. Again, this position is not subject to Senate confirmation, so Bolton will be starting in a few weeks. It's within the White House. Now, Bolton was a prominent foreign policy official in the George W. Bush administration. Bush appointed him as the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control in 2001. He played an important political role within, in, within the administration during the run-up to the Iraq War because of his department's focus and responsibility for weapons of mass destruction policy. Obviously, the administration's public case for the war in 2002 and 2003 depended on the claim that Saddam Hussein's Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Bolton was a forceful advocate for this claim within the Bush administration. Consequently, he has been implicated in political arguments that the administration deliberately manipulated intelligence to make this argument in support of going to war in, against Iraq in 2003. More specifically, studies of the intelligence failures during this period of deliberation within the administration criticized Bolton for threatening the careers of intelligence officers who challenged the conclusions that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction. Now, President Bush nominated Bolton to be the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations in 2005. He could not secure confirmation in the Senate while the Republicans held the majority there, same party. Republicans and Democrats objected to his nomination for a couple of reasons. The first was his role in the intelligence failures leading up to the war in Iraq. And additionally, a number of people testified to Congress that Bolton had been abusive to people that worked under him to his subordinates. Bush later got around the Senate by appointing Bolton while the Senate was in recess, and he served as the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. until 2006. Now, since then, Bolton has remained in the public eye, acting as a prominent foreign policy commentator on Fox News. He's written a number of high-profile op-eds. He clearly opposes the Iran nuclear deal. And in March of 2015, he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times arguing that the United States should bomb Iran to prevent it from acquiring a nuclear weapon. He argued that diplomacy could not alter Iran's ultimate political interest in acquiring nuclear weapons. And he argued that Iranian acquisition, acquisition of a nuclear bomb would then cause a larger nuclear arms race in the Middle East in which Saudi Arabia would simply buy a nuclear bomb from Pakistan and Egypt and Turkey would then develop their own nuclear weapons programs. Bolton felt that a series of targeted airstrikes on Iranian facilities could delay its nuclear weapons program by three to five years. This article did not discuss the possibility that such strikes could provoke a retaliatory military strikes or a larger war from Iran. And note as well how this three to five year window of delay compares to the 10 year window in the current Iran nuclear accord. Now then, a few weeks ago, Bolton wrote another op-ed in the Wall Street Journal defending the legal right of the United States to launch a preemptive military strike against North Korea now because it's developing the missile capacity to launch a nuclear weapon against the continental United States. He argued that the speed at which nuclear-armed missiles travel, along with their capacity to strike from one continent to another, together change the legal boundaries of what constitutes an imminent threat so severe as to justify a preemptive first strike by the United States. He argues that the U.S. is in such a situation right now with North Korea. It cannot afford to wait until North Korea definitely has the capacity to launch a nuclear-armed missile strike against the continental United States. So Bolton says the U.S. should attack now. So this is a little bit of background on Bolton. We're going to watch some videos now that talk more about his policy views. We'll begin with a clip from Face the Nation on Sunday. 
Note that the panelists disagree about his grand strategy orientation. We're gonna come back to this throughout our conversation today. So let's go ahead and watch that clip. And we saw another shakeup at the White House this week. H.R. McMaster, who has been rumored to be departing the White House for some time, actually is now resigning. He's being replaced by John Bolton. What does that signal about what's ahead for foreign policy? Well, I think it signals buckle up. Um, John Bolton is a uh, very, very skilled tactician. Uh, he has been around Washington for decades. Uh, he has held uh, some of the most extreme uh, views uh, now represented in, in, in the White House uh, in, in administrations past and, and in between those administrations. Uh, and he has been consistent. Uh, I do not expect him to change those views at all. He is uh, an interventionist uh, in, in the classic sense. Uh, he's, he was the original neoconservative. Uh, and but the president campaign saying he didn't support those ideas. Right. He, uh, the president has, has said that the Iraq war was one of the biggest blunders of uh, uh, American history, not just foreign policy, history, period. Uh, John Bolton was and remains a, a resolute supporter of, of, of the Iraq war. Uh, I think it, it very much remains to be seen how, how, how they mesh on, on policy. Uh, it, Trump appears to like Bolton for his, uh, his pithy, forthright opinions, often expressed on Fox News, uh, but also just that, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a guy who, who Trump recognizes. He, he is uh, very opinionated and very firm in those uh, opinions. And one of the things he didn't like about McMaster is that he thought that McMaster was too cerebral and, and caveated everything out of this hand and that hand. He didn't like that. I think one thing that's worth noting about President Trump is that during the campaign, he did campaign uh, against the Iraq war, but that wasn't necessarily uh, sort of a, a dovish position. President, uh, President Trump, throughout the campaign in 2016, said that what the United States military should have done is taken the oil. Mm -hmm. It should have been much more aggressive. It should have mm -hmm. essentially acted as an almost imperial power in Iraq. And I think there's a degree to which Bolton, uh, the Bolton choice reflects this aggressiveness uh, within Trump's political message, even that, that, that was there at the same time that Trump was skeptical of the Iraq war. I, I agree with that. I mean, he, he is not a neoconservative. He does not believe in the promotion the of democracy. The president is not. No, no, no Bolton is Bolton. not. Um, he is much more in the category of Dick Cheney, um, a hard power realist, um, an interventionist, exactly right, um, but not with an idealistic bent. Um, so I think it does kind of fit the president in a certain way. But I think sometimes we read a little bit too much into these, too, because I'm not sure that this represents some kind of change in policy. I think it's just equally plausible that the president likes people who play loyalists on television. Um, and that's exactly what he was. In, and I think that's what attracted the president to him, not his views on. OK, so let me make a few points here. First, uh, John Bolton is going to be effective in a certain way because he's a skilled political operator. I mean, he's been around the block. He's done this for a lot of years. He's done well in multiple administrations. He has a prominent public role and has vo you know, taken positions uh, on uh, high-profile issues on Fox News. And so he, he's uh, going to hit the ground running, he, I, I think. Uh, second, he is a consistent hardliner. And the most important and most consistent part of his positions is that he supports militaristic foreign policy. He is an advocate and a firm believer in the power of American military force. And thus, he is ready to use that uh, instrument, military force, through interventions on a regular basis, at least his rhetoric. Uh, suggest that. Now, third, there is some debate about whether he might clash with President Trump in terms of policy. And you saw the, the uh, comment about how uh, John Bolton was part of the Bush administration that went to war against Iraq, and, and he ha was a, a very strong supporter of the Iraq war then and continues to be. But Donald Trump, when he was campaigning for president, uh, campaigned against that war and said it was a big mistake. And so some people argue, well, there might be a clash there. Now, you've got to watch this. Uh, we're going to talk more about this potential conflict in a subsequent um, clip. But the 
the gap between Bolton and Trump uh, might be exaggerated here. Uh, people that know him better, um, like uh, the uh, the a journalist Gerson, who is also on this last clip, uh, who was in the Bush administration, suggests that there's not a lot of difference in policy views between a John Bolton and Donald Trump. And fourth, there's this debate about grand strategies and, and uh, about the grand strategy of John Bolton. And there was a, uh, an op-ed piece in the New York Times uh, by the columnist um, Ross Dudhat, um, who went into a great deal of detail about John Bolton's strategy. Is he a neocon? Uh, the initial Washington Post reporter said yes, but uh, Bolton himself says he's not, and other commentators have said, no, he's, he's not a neocon. He's more like Dick Cheney, this um, hard power realist. They're, they are committed to an aspect of the strategy that the Bush administration, which was animated by a lot of neoconservative thinking, and that is the willingness to use unilaterally U.S. military power. But unlike the neocons, John Bolton is not committed to promoting liberal world order and um, uh, values such as the spread of democracy and human rights. He's really kind of a primacy guy. And we're going to see more evidence of that in a subsequent uh, clip. So now we want to run another clip about Bolton. This is from the weekly Friday night discussion between Mark Shields and David Brooks that appears on the PBS NewsHour. Now, Shields is um, usually characterized as being on the political left, and Brooks is on the center right. And so you want to watch a couple of quick clips here of, of uh, David Brooks in particular talking about the Bolton uh, appointment. So let's roll that now. David, what do you make not only of Bolton, but just the sequence of changes almost <clears throat> one right after the other? At the well, first on Bolton, I think ideologically Trump should, probably should have picked him first. You know, I think uh, presidents should pick the sort of person who shares their worldview. And if there's anybody in the Republican foreign policy galaxy who shares Trump's worldview, it's John Bolton. Uh, in the administration, he came up with, a, he was talking about America first long before Donald Trump ever was. Uh, when he served earlier in the, in the earlier Bush administration, he was a relentless foe of sort of the Republican establishment, the Colin Powells. He was a relentless foe of the conservative, of the neoconservatives who w believed in democracy and human rights. He was an old style, what we call paleocon, power versus power kind of conservative. So if Trump at least got somebody who agrees with. Uh, temperamentally, I agree with Mark. He, w he was famously thought of as a, a kiss up, kick down kind of guy. Uh, he was famously thought of as someone who did not uh, look at issues honestly, look at intelligence honestly, but came with a highly ideological predisposition. Uh, I don't think he's the worst thing in the world. I, uh, you know, he comes across a lot of issues in a way that I do think seriously increase the chance that we'll have some military action in North Korea and Iran. But he's not a, a complete loon. He just has a, 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 a bellicose old style, we need just need more powerful than anybody else around, and we need to threaten that power all the time, which when you take it, combine it with a temperamentally unstable president, that's a dangerous combination. So first, note his characterization of Bolton's policy not views. Not a complete loon. Not a complete loon. <laughs> That's not very reassuring. Um, but he suggests, argues, that he's closely aligned with Trump. He focuses on the importance of power, power politics. We need to need more military. The U.S. needs more military power and needs to be more comfortable threatening to use it to get to achieve its political goals and political interests. And and Brooks notes that this could be a dangerous combination with Trump, but we see in this discussion an emphasis on primacy again. Second, um, he, he notes some of the, the critiques of Bolton's management style that have been before. Tough on subordinates, um, kiss up or pleasing to superiors, and he notes the problems in the Bush administration with respect to the politicization of intelligence gathering in the run up to that war. And, and he reinforces again, this is a tough political Operative. So let's now we're going to watch a third clip on Bolton again from David Brooks. It's going to t allow us to talk on grand strategy a little bit more. Let's run that clip. Two of them are there. I still think it's a far from a sure thing that it will be a super bellicose, super uh, militaristic. You know, the, the foreign policy school that Trump has somehow glommed onto and then John Bolton definitely subscribes to really goes back into ancient pre World War II Republican history, which was much more heartland, much more. Uh, 
isolationist almost, but no sense of foreign policy idealism. No None. sense that we want to make the world a better place, that we want to give people dignity, we want to give them human rights. That's not part of the equation. It's much more, we're in a great power struggle, and they're tough, and we're tough. And that's just the way they see the world. It's, a, it's an old-fashioned, more, as I say, pre-Cold War style of Republican foreign policy, but it de did tend to be not adventurous. Uh, and so uh, there was some restraint even back in the early America first days. So you don't see them being quick on the trigger? As I say, more quick on the trigger than with Rex Tillerson and H.R. McMaster, that's for sure. But I wouldn't say we're necessarily, you know, marching off to war. I do think Trump still, his instinct is, I don't want to spend uh, blood and treasure abroad. Uh, his constituency does not want to fight another war. Uh, I think he would be slow to want to commit troops anywhere just by his instinct. He's a domestic policy. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the kind of grand strategy of these two political officials. We shouldn't expect to see any foreign policy idealism. They're not going to be about promoting democracy and human rights. They're not going to be adventurous. Or adventurous. And so there's some, right, Brooks is suggesting that there's some, there's some built-in restraint into their grand strategy or foreign policy, yeah. given how they define American interests. Yeah, and, and we should note that Donald Trump has also a record of um, being resistant to get involved in local conflicts and regional conflicts. And so that, that probably will persist. Even if you threaten to use um, military power more, he still has that side of him too. Um, so, Right. And the one thing to think about, though, is will the rest of the world, so if, if there is this desire to threaten to use military force and maybe have small military strikes but not engage in an adventurous war where there's a significant troop deployment, the question to think about is will the rest of the world allow the Trump administration to engage in this type of grand strategy, which relies on threats to use force or the limited use of military force and then some withdrawal? Or is the U.S. going to suffer some deeper military penalty or escalation that forces it to respond and engage in a larger military conflict if it does something like the bloody nose strategy? Right. In a sense, Brooks is saying Bolton is likely to support the bloody nose strategy, um, which is a limited military strike designed to reinforce conventional deterrence and convince North Korea that the U.S. is serious about using force. But if his base won't support an extended military conflict, can the administration, something we want you to think about is, can the administration always control the escalation? Or by initiating a strike in the first place, does it get dragged into something that it doesn't That's want right. to fight That's over right. the long so, run? And so the, the danger might not be what some, I mean, the New York Times had this you know, editorial that says, says, watch out, he's going to start wars all over the place. It might not be that as much as you might stumble into some long-term kind of quagmire type of conflict because you... Are, Oh, you overestimate your ability to control limited use of military power. If you think you can just go into Syria and do a quick strike and then get out, yeah. or even go and have a quick strike against North Korea, and that'll be the end of it, yeah. that might be the real danger here, and is that you can't control the escalation. Yeah. And this, and this is the real lesson, or this, this is the larger implications of Syria, right? So we have right. the escalation in Syria, the troops are in there longer than they were promised to be, but the question is, can the U.S. have them there, threaten to use them, but then avoid getting dragged into a larger multi-party struggle? Um, so far, it's done that, right? We're talking right. about 2,500 troops on the ground. Right. I mean, um, it's not a big ISIS has been defeated. The question is, is this a sustainable strategy over the long run? And, you know, we'll see. And one of the dangers here is also that Donald Trump himself doesn't seem to have a real core grand strategy, right? And so he floats and, and at times talks about retrenchment and then at other times likes to talk tough and talk about primacy. And so he doesn't have a, a center here. And so a Bolton will influence him uh, perhaps that's what some people are afraid of more than uh, other presidents who had much more well-defined strategy.